Brooke, welcome to the show. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Brooke Telephone, and I run two different podcasts. I run an audio drama called The Hundred Handed, and I also do a more traditional style podcast called The Personhood Project. And can you tell us the difference between those two shows and how they work? Sure. When I tell people about The Hundred Handed, I generally say we're kind of like a movie for the ears. So we're basically uh, seasons and each season has an episode, sort of like you think of on Netflix. Um, we just don't have any visual picture, but everything's done in a straight storyline. Whereas the other one, The Personhood Project, I said was more traditional, meaning it's an interview between a host and a, and a guest. So like we're, we're doing right now. So you have both formats. Which format do you like the most? Personally, I like the audio drama format the most. And what are some differences in the way that those two shows are put together and how they how the production works on those shows? The production is, is extremely different for both of the shows. I'm going to start with The Hundred Handed and then talk about The Personhood Project. Um, the Hundred Handed, when we produce that show, we get all the actors together in a single room and we all kind of play off the energy of one another. We don't take any recordings from anywhere else. Everyone has to be local. We all have to be in the same room together. We generally record in a studio of some sort and do it that way. Multiple takes, lots of different things going on. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of energy in the room, whereas it's just as much fun and just as much energy, but just a different way. With the Personhood Project, we're interviewing the host and a poet are being interviewed. That poet can be anywhere in the U.S. And so while there's also no video, it's more of a conversation kind of like we're doing right now. Let's talk about the audio drama and some of the things that go into the pre-production process and the production process for that show. Oh, OK. Wow. There's a lot, a lot more than I originally thought. When I first started doing this, I was like, hey, this is going to be a great idea. Um, I had a studio, we recorded bands, and I did a lot of voice narration work. And I thought, okay, well, how hard can it be? We'll just like find somebody to write a cool show, and then I'll just get some actors together and we'll just record. And that was extremely naive. I mean, it does work that way, but it, there's a lot more to it that I've learned um, over the years of doing this. I mean, that's what happens finding talent, like interviewing people for positions that we have, merging schedules together. We, um, like getting the writer, figuring out who's going to fit best with what voice and what cast and how many people we have. So I guess, is there a certain part of that you want me to like delve into? Yes. <laughs> Imagine, because we, we have podcasting students who are going to want to do this kind of podcast. Usually people are doing interviews like what we're doing now, but every once in a while, someone wants to do an audio drama. I would love to be able to get some insights into that process and how it differs from the interview style podcast, because I can imagine people getting excited about that format of storytelling. Oh, OK. It's my favorite by far. So I would say the very first thing that I would tell people who would want to do this is find a writer. Uh, if you're the writer, that's great. You, good for you. But for most people, like you're not the writer and the producer and the talent finder and the audio engineer and the sound effects person and the music score. So these are all things that you're going to have to have, right, um, to make it viable within the community now. First, find somebody. Well, I guess first decide what genre you even want to be in, right? So just to be like, I'm going to make an audio drama is like, okay, well, what area do you want to go into? Do you want to go into sci-fi? you want to go into fantasy? you want to go whatever direction you want to go? Pick a genre. Then make sure you find somebody who writes in that genre. Then you have to find somebody who writes what you'd actually like to produce in that genre. So that can take a little bit of time. I got really lucky and honestly just randomly connected with a friend of a friend who was in a program, an MFA program at Texas State, and was like, hey, I know a guy who might be interested that knows a guy who might be interested. And I was like... All right, let's see what happens. So basically, don't cut out any friend of a friend of a I might know somebody who just be like, let's chat and see what happens. And and then that guy and I have been working together for years now. He's one of my very best friends. <laughs> so it, it works out really well. In that case, we kind of talked about like, what do we see? Originally, we are kind of wanting to go in the sci-fi direction. But honestly, his name's Tom. Tom is can write sci-fi, but his love was more in like urban fantasy, like dark urban fantasy. You know what? I was willing to just be like, sure, let's do it. Let's see what happens. He wrote um, he wrote a pilot and we kind of like bounced ideas back and forth. The writing 
component of it is way more in depth than I expected. And so you can't just expect your writer to all of a sudden be like, episode, episode, episode. That just doesn't happen. Like the whole writing part of it is like creating an entire world in this case and figuring things out and storyboarding and laying it out. Where I'm going with this is you want to leave yourself enough time. Like you can't be like, I'm going to find a writer and it's going to happen in a week. And then I'm going to have an entire season ready to go in a month. If that works for you, that's fantastic. But I've never, I've never seen it work that way. So we actually gave a good bit of pre-production time to like figuring out how to do everything in that case. And it's really important to get all your ducks in a row first before you even like think of putting out anything anywhere. So it, it honestly took us over probably six to eight months before we even put like even started recording. And then after that, it took a while to even put anything out. So, okay, there we go. You've got a writer. You've got a script that you love. That's awesome. Now you have to find people who actually want to read it. Not only do you have to find people that you want to read it, you have to find people who are willing to read it and generally read it for free. Because most people I know don't have a lot of extra cash laying around to, uh, to pay professional actors and actresses. So, that being said, what we did was put a call out into the community and we're kind of like, hey, who wants to, who's interested, any voice actors out there? The first one that we did season one, I really just like picked from a bunch of my friends. I was like, who do I know in the theater? Who do I know that loves acting? Who do I know that has like a weird voice? Even if they're not like a perfect voice actor, like who's got like a really cool sounding voice? And so you would... I would like be out places and like closing my eyes, just listening to people sometimes. And I was like, oh man, I look weird, but I don't care because <laughs> it doesn't matter. So anyway, we found one of our lead actors through the, um, the call out into the community that we did. And he was fantastic and absolutely love him. His name is Gage. Um, it was just like, hey man, you got a fantastic voice. You ever thought about and I, it feels so skeevy. You ever thought about being in the industry, right? But I totally did that to him. And he was like, actually, yeah, I have. And so he's really excited about it. Uh, so anyway, okay, so now you've got, let's say you've got all your people together. You've gone out. And by a community blast, I mean, I went out and I just posted online. I did a couple like community Facebook posts. Um, this is because I'm old. You would probably want to do like Insta or something like that now or thread. But like, I don't know. I'm not good on the social media part. That's not my my forte. I also like reached out to like local theaters. I reached out to theater departments and universities, things like that. So that it was like, hey, do you know anybody who's interested? Do you have people that might be looking for this? We needed a range of voices. So we needed everything from like children to senior level voices uh, and, and kind of a range in between there. The other thing that was important, and this was this was kind of kind of interesting just in thinking about it, uh, you have to think about the content that you're asking someone to read and their own personal views in that content. So I did run across, like, I had a friend and I was like, hey, you want to read this role? And she was fantastic. And she's like, actually, I'm, like, trying to get a job at this place. And I don't know that I can have my, like, voice and name attached to this role because the role we were asking her to do was a mother who was walking down an alley and her child is abducted in front of her and murdered. And so like, well, by a monster, in all fairness, by a monster called a tear drinker um, that like sucks tears out of your eyes. Anyway, so you listen to the podcast and you'll hear about it. But that being said, she was like, look, I'm, I'm working on getting like, she was working on her degree to work with children. And she just felt like maybe counseling children and being in this role didn't exactly line up right. Okay, no problem. And you just have to be really gracious too. You can't get frustrated with people and be like, no, you should do it or get angry. It's just like, all right, doesn't fit. Let's move on. Thanks for thinking about it. And then like my brother recorded with me and he was in law school and he's like, I don't want this pulling up on my social like stuff when people see me. And I was like, okay, so I made up a fake name for him and everything, which was kind of fun. So, I mean, and I tell people like, you can go anonymously if you want to, we'll just make up a fake name for you and... I just need your voice. Just give me your voice. Okay, but speaking of that, that's actually a good segue into just give me your voice because um, we have an attorney that I hired, which was probably the most expensive part of all of this. I hired an attorney to create an LLC for us and to draft up um, talent agreements and agreements with all my contractors for everything because you don't want someone coming back and being like, hey, you have my voice and there's copyright, there's all kinds of like legal 
things that go along that. So we have everyone, even my brother, who is a lawyer, I made him sign one, an agreement saying, like, it's just all laid out. It's a very standard contract um, that we own your voice. And we, well, we don't own your voice. We own the audio that you did for us. <laughs> we don't own your voice. And in some cases, I would like to do that. But that way, and I always laugh and people are always like, you know, do I really need to sign this? And I'm like, actually, I love you, but you really do. Yes, because, you know, friends are friends until you're not. And then it becomes messy. And this just helps make sure that nothing gets messy. I've never had a friend not sign it. You know, I've never had anybody like be upset about it. So we have one for people who do like music and sound effects and stuff for us. And then we have another one for all of the actors and things like that. So so that's important. I would I would definitely say that's a, a critical piece in it, because the last thing you want to do is be producing something and you finally start to make some money. And then somebody comes back to you and is like, where's mine? But yeah, that's not going to feel good. Some audio dramas like to do it where they take people from all over the country and they have them record their voices and then they put it in the software and they cut it up and spice it all together right and it sounds great and they do a fine job and everything's good we wanted to do something a little bit different so i wanted everybody local our audio drama focuses on austin specifically and san marcos area and san antonio so everything that's being done is being done in this area and we want we've just wanted people to be in the area all together Kind of like to get that energy because like when you're in a room with someone you can feed off of them right and so like as my part when i do the producing we get everybody in the room do you want me to go over like equipment and stuff like that that we use or i would love to know as much as we can about this format because our students are in an a week class and most of them will never be able to do this for the purposes of the podcasting class so giving them a full taste of what this theatrical drama takes I think is really important for rounding out the course. So yes, as much detail as we can. Yeah. All right. So originally I had a full studio in my house because I ran a studio um, that recorded bands and things like that before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, we had to move everything. And that was right at the beginning that we started doing all this. So I moved the entire studio into my house. And I'm talking like full giant uh, console and microphone, everything you would record bands with, I put in my house. And so... We recorded that way for quite a while until um, until I sold off everything and decided I didn't want to do it anymore because I wasn't going to record bands anymore. I just want to do podcasts. And to be honest with you, um, you don't need that. Like there are so many good things out there. You don't need that at all. So what I did was call up a friend of mine who works at Sweetwater. And I don't know if um, if I can plug them or not, but they're fantastic. <laughs> so And they're really nice and they'll help you set up anything you want. So, um, so I called him and I was like, hey, I need some podcasting mics. I need some pop filters. Those are the things you put in front of your face to take out the P's and S's so you don't go and like, and nobody wants to hear that. That, that drives you insane. So you can actually buy mics really like, I'm not saying cheap, they're not like 20 bucks from Walmart or something, but like put a couple hundred bucks into a mic and you're going to get a good mic and it's going to work just fine. And then you buy some recording software or or you don't even have to do that now. We used to use everything through, um, oh, dang, let's see the Pro Tools. There we go. But it's expensive and they changed their price structuring in the middle. And we got grandfathered in, but now I think it's like several hundred dollars. It might be like six or seven hundred dollars now for that. And that's a lot. And you don't need it because you can use Audacity. You can use GarageBand. You can use so many different ones out there that are way cheaper. You don't need to use Pro Tools if you're doing this. Like, it, honestly, you really don't. There's great stuff out there. You don't have to do to spend hundreds of dollars to do it, um, which is probably nice if you're a student, too, because there aren't extra hundreds of dollars just floating around. So that being said, everything we need fits in a backpack at this point like literally a backpack we have four mics we have all the pop filters that we need we have all the cables that go with them and we just plug into a regular computer and we run it through there and it sounds just as good as it would if you um go to a studio so however you can do that and we have done that um for the beginning of our our season two we rented a studio in austin from a guy that we know and we're like hey we just want to come in for the day and use the whole studio for eight hours he records it all to you and then sends you all the files but you have to be super uber organized to do that. So like I had to be so, okay, let's go back. You've got a script. You've got people. You've got your equipment. Now what do you do? Well, you got to get everybody together, which means you have to figure out everybody else's schedules and when they can arrive. And 
What you don't want to do is have all your actors come in and you have various scenes and you have one person in a first scene and they're just sitting there for three hours later when they're done waiting for the next scene. So what I do is I go through and I categorize every scene, every actor, and predominantly how many lines they have in each scene. So how we're going to take it, where we're going to take it. And then I set it up because we will be recording probably, I mean, an eight hour recording, we might get three three and a half, maybe four episodes done. And that's like drilling people through them. That's not, I mean, we're not sitting around chewing the fat, right? Is that the right? I was going to say something else. And then I was like, don't curse. What can I use instead? Yeah. And if you've never rented a studio, a cheap one's 500 bucks for the day. Just like, so yes, I did. I literally run a very tight ship. And I think that's great because I was in education a long time and I have lots of children. So I'm used to organizing people and I don't mind being bossy. Like I bossed the sound engineer around. I was like, episode 13, scene three, recording now. Take two, take three. And then I was like, this is episode 15, scene six. We're recording now. Like, you know, and it, and it really is. You do sort of have to be bossy if you're going to get anything done because everybody wants to sit around and talk and they want to do this and they want to hang out here. And, and it's great. And you want your actors to connect together. But at the same time, like you're paying, you need to get your money it's worth out of it. So that being said, you got to get everybody together in a room. You need to make sure that you laid out everything to be able to utilize your time in the most efficiently possible. And laying out your time isn't just about saving yourself money when you're in a studio. It's also about making sure that you're respecting your actor's time too and what they're doing for you. Because remember, they're doing this for free. And so to be like, I just want you to sit in my house or I wish you to sit in the studio all day long. It's a big ask. It really is. A lot of people have a lot of other things going on in their lives and, and it's a lot. So if you can tell someone, I need you from 10 to noon... And we're going to record those two hours together and I'll get you out when you're done there. Then they're much happier than saying, oh, we're going to be here from, you know, 10 to 6 and you can just hang out and doing it that way. You also have to send them their scripts ahead of time and you have to be um, you have to be a little bit pushy about making sure they read them. Like, come prepared. Don't come in here and not know what you're going to say or when you're going to say it. And I've had to talk to people about that before and been like, hey... And you can do it nice. Or you can do it mean. I've tried both ways. So being nice is a much better way to be. So in that case, um, you just want to gently tell someone like, we really need you to be prepared and it really helps. And line delivery, we don't have to go through as many takes. So that's a lot nicer in that way. So then once you figure out the kinks with some of your actors and the timing and the figuring all of that out, you get them all together. And that is where the magic happens. And that is by far my super favorite part. Sometimes I will do kind of like fun things i'm trying to think of like an example um to get people like excited and in their role um as we do like funny voices with each other and i ask people just stay in character like come in here and like be in character like you are this character now you are a um a gargoyle a stone gargoyle who owns a head shop right because how funny is a stoned gargoyle anyway it's a great play the uh, see season two for that one and i also let people know like how do you handle how do we handle mistakes how do we handle retakes and that's a really important part of it too my way that i do it uh, and there's no right or wrong way to do it i've just found that this is the easiest way to do it is just to be like stop say it again keep going uh and do it again so if you mess up a line okay uh i also tell people like while the dialogue is there and it's written if it doesn't feel natural don't say it that way you know, like, say it the way that feels natural to you. Don't be like, golly gee, look at that, Skipper. You know, like, if you're like, hot dang, you know, like, what would you say? You wouldn't say golly gee. You would say, like, well, whatever I would say, I can't say on camera right now. But, like, flow with it, right? Like, if you've got a sentence that feels awkward, you know what? The writer sometimes is writing so quickly and trying to get things done. And we've got so many people editing and looking at stuff. So throws like, falls through the cracks and just go with it it's not going to change the whole outcome like don't be so picky you know get it done and then other times I tell people like we're just gonna roll this entire scene like if you make a mistake you make a mistake I don't care don't even stop just keep going stay in character do what you're doing my favorite thing to do though is to be like you'll hear me and a lot of it and I'm sure that uh our engineer is gonna do an outtake of this because I'm always saying give me more give me more give me more right like <laughs> So we'll just stop and you'll hear me in the background going like, uh, so I had a friend of mine who hadn't done any acting before and we put him in and this death scene and we were like, all right, you're going to die because we just need you for a little bit. 
And um, and he's like, uh, okay, I was just sitting here hanging out with you, but now I'm acting. And I was like, yeah, you can do this. Uh, and we had such a fun time. And it actually ended up to be a really good scene because in it, I was like, you're dying. You're dying. You know, like, so you have to be like dramatic and fun with people. Here's another really great, great tip about this is that you have to overact in audio dramas. You have no visual for people to see. So you have to do it almost to where it feels cheesy. Like it almost feels really cheesy to where you're like, I don't know about that. But by the time someone's listening to it and they're auditorily processing it, like you've got to give it 110% into that like performance. Like your excitement has to be above excitement. Your, you know, sadness has to be like peak sadness. Like you've got to pull it from the depths of inside of you because if you're not doing that, it sounds really monotone and that's not fun to listen to. Nobody wants to listen to monotone actors being like, the ship is about to explode. Oh no, what are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe we're all going to die. Like that, that has, you want to be like, the ship's exploding. You know, like you want to be like telling people you're in a ship and it's exploding. How would you do it? You know, but you also have to tell them to back up on the mic. If they're going to yell. That's also fun too, where I'm like, oh, no, you clipped out your audio clipped out bad. Like you need to like lean back and shout. And so that's fun. And, it, and it's fun to like um, coach people through that where you're like, you know, you're literally in the lair of a villain and they have you strapped to a chair and they're about to insert a giant needle up your nose to suck your soul out. This is not like a, oh no, please don't moment. This is like a, get your dirty hands off me, you filthy ape, you know, from Planet of the Apes. Maybe that was a really old reference. Sorry about that. But yeah, so overacting is a great way to go. And that's really important. And a lot of people don't don't get that. So I'm always telling people, give me more, give me more, give me more. Um, and it's uh, and it has a disappointed yet. One of the hard things is we've tried doing music overlaid into everyone's headphones. That's like ambient music of a coffee shop. So you feel like you're there. Ambient music of crickets chirping outside. Oh, my God. That's such a bad idea. Don't do that. It doesn't help anyone. It just makes it messy for everyone because then they're shouting over or they're talking and they can't figure it out. And it's just dreadful. However, if there are certain things in the script that are happening, I'm the one that goes like this, bang, you know, because like a sound effect's going to go in there later. So you have to kind of tell people like, I need you to act with no sound. And it's, and it's not the easiest thing to do to ask someone like, Hey, there's going to be a garbage can slamming down because the monsters are going to be stomping on top of it. Give me some good screaming. Ah, it's not cutting it, right? So sometimes I'll make like sound effects. So you do have to be really re careful in your recording that other mics aren't picking up that same noise. So I will be the funny one and I'll be like, crash, bang, boom, you know, or I'll put in like, audience goes crazy here. So it's helpful to kind of explain to people like there will be sound effects in, you know, and things like that. So it will, it'll be totally different. It'll feel totally different once they're done recording it. The recording part of it sort of, um, for a lot of people who haven't done it, feels awkward because there's nothing there. So they're just kind of waiting and you're like, the door slams. And then the producer will be like, slam, something stupid like that. But uh, we do like doing the Foley sound effects. I'll pop that in here right now. Foley effects are super fun. Um, if you can slam a door or if you can, you know, clap your hands or stomp something or drop something. I mean, we've done everything from like recording, dropping giant chains from Home Depot into the bathtub to like going outside and literally laying on the grass and like rubbing the grass to like get certain sounds that were fun. You don't have to do that because luckily it is the 21st century and there is a whole host of software you can buy that gives you every sound effect you could imagine. Um, in fact, we just got a software that makes footsteps only um, by a keyboard. And you can literally just go like step, step, step. You can program what kind of shoe it is. You can program the weight of the person. You can put like a jacket on them in the background. So it's like step, swish, step, swish. You can make them run step, 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 like that. So it's fun. And I think it was a bit of a splurge. We spent a couple hundred bucks just on that one software to make fo footsteps. But yeah, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, one of the funnier parts of doing all of this is that for a long time, we get together with the engineer and the writer and myself, and we would put sound effects in, right? We would go into and figure out the sound effects. Um, and they have like a list and it'll be like, person, what was the one of the funniest ones we did? Oh, like person gagging, right? And then all of a sudden, everyone in the room, you're like listening to all these sound effects and people go like, eh, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, 
like you can't help but like feel grossed out by it or like what's a good sound for blood splatter and you're like hmm and you have to be creative with that too so that's a lot of fun it's extremely time consuming but let's go away from sound effects and things and go back to we're all in a room together and we're all recording and we've got this whole thing done um everybody has been awesome and they've done their they fill out their forms and they've acted their hearts out and you've said thank you thank you so much and um and then you've captured their audio and then they all leave and the other important thing on this is if you find someone that's going to be running throughout your entire audio drama you need to make sure that they are committed to being part of your entire audio drama so that can be a problem we ran into a bit of a snag on that we have this uh character called solomon who is um I don't know. I think his name is like, or her or it as a dusty mummy uh, that comes from another universe that creates um, magical ink for tattoos. They're the tattoo artist that like puts them. Anyway, you got to watch it to understand. But just know that this voice in this voice, the woman who originally did it, did it. And it was sort of like intense. And um, and I'm not even good at it. I don't I can't mimic what she did. But just know it was like that weird voice. And I had to find someone and it took a long time because she moved to Florida and I was like, oh, that's not going to work. So, so I had to find someone and just give them a clip of it and be like, can you mimic this? Oh, no, you can't. Can you mimic this? Oh, all right. Huh. Who do I know that could mimic this? <laughs> you know? And so those types of things kind of run into issues. Another great thing, though, about a single voice actor is that they can play multiple parts, which is kind of cool. Um, you can have them either change their voice for you. Or you can um, modify their voice once it's recorded. So we've done, I mean, I think I've played several monsters before. I like those roles best. There's a lot of growling in them generally, which is fun. Um, and odd voices that you can do. But you can overlay, you can change voices, you can add reverb to things. You can do all kinds of stuff to like play around with a voice to make it really interesting. Um in that case. So I know there's like some really cool audio dramas out there and people are like, oh, this one person did all hundred of these voices. And it's pretty cool. That's intense and it will take a lot of time, but it's still pretty neat and can be done. So I'm just saying, if you don't like people, like you want to do an audio drama, you can still do one all by yourself. All right. I guess after that, we take all of the recordings. They're given to you not as a, and this is important because like I didn't realize this. The recordings aren't given to you as like a single recording where you're like, oh, here's the recording. They give it to you like, here's one person's voice at the mic. Here's another person's voice. Here's another. So you have like, however, let's say you have four. So, so you have four people talking in a scene. You'll have four independent files that go across. You've then got to go in and splice and cut every single piece in and out, in and out, in and out to make sure that you're only getting the right mic of the right person at the right time and then moving everybody else around and shifting and changing. Talk about time consuming. That is probably, I mean, I know that our engineer says, oh, it's not that bad once you get the hang of it, but it's a lot of work, a lot of work. I guess maybe I should go on a quick tangent about like how long does all of this take? This doesn't, this is not like I feel like doing this in an afternoon. This is like, it takes a long time to do all all the components together and again that just depends on how much you uh, have to work for pay so to how long it'll take right and how many people you have and how long you're waiting on them for things as well that's important to kind of keep in mind is that you're not going to get this done in a week it's it's not a week long even if you put 40 hours in you might okay maybe if you get an episode done in a week by the time you've cut all the audio well a 40 hours is pretty good. I would say we could probably put one together now in 40 hours, which isn't too bad for turnaround. I mean, that's, and that's a, like editing all the voices, putting in all the sound effects, making sure that all the music is in it. Then you want to have to make sure that you mix it. You don't necessarily need to master it, but you do need to make sure that all your levels are right. So I'm not an engineer, but I can tell you just a few of the pieces that like I've learned over the years. Number one, cutting the audio from the actors is the most boring part of it. Number two, the most fun part of it is putting all the sound effects in, but then you can sort of like, I don't know, for me, it's okay. It's like standing on the cereal aisle. You're like, oh, there's so many choices. Which one do I choose? Which one's best? Well, there's like three different ones I love. And sometimes you can go down a rabbit hole and you're like, I've just been listening to gagging noises for the last 35 minutes. I could have just picked the very first one I heard, but for some reason I felt I needed to listen to 
36 more gagging noises from people or footsteps or pot banging or door slamming or there's all kinds of things that go in there. And you have to really think a lot about what sound effects are you putting in? What ambient noise is there in the room? Where are the characters in your head in relation to where they're standing to like how loud their voices are? Are they right up close to one another? Are they, you know, are they across a room yelling at each other? Do you have one on one side of the door and another one on the other side of the door? Um, which is going to change how you put effects on it and stuff. So there's all of that, which is a lot of fun. Three, for musicians, they love the music part. I'm not a musician. So to me, I'm like, eh, just throw in some canned music. We're good. And that's not how the musicians feel about it. They want to like score everything and make it all perfect. It's not necessary, honestly, to do that. Like if you listen to a bunch of audio dramas, that's not happening in a lot of them. So you don't necessarily have to have a musician score stuff. We just have been really lucky and found a couple of people who love doing it and are very excited about doing it. That being said, another quick tangent, you need a theme, like a theme song, like some kind of like TV shows do. You need to have some kind of theme music that brings it in. You've got to have your opening credits and your closing credits and all of that kind of fun stuff. So you need someone that's going to read them and do that. Yeah, I was like, I think that's everything that goes in to my part of uh, of doing it. Well, then there's the uploading right? So let's say it's all done and you're like, woo! Uh, then you got to figure out who's going to host it and what platforms are you going to use? And you just get an RSS. Again, I'm terrible at this part. So I know that we use Anchor for a while and I know that we uh, now use Buzzsprout. That's what I know. And people awesome. always want to know, people always want to know how much money do you make, right? How much money do you make? We have put in hundreds of hours to this, hundreds of hours. i have made like off off podcast money like for listens um we currently have over sixty five thousand downloads i have made i think it's close to like 47 on listens or something like that just so that um people are really clear that this is like a passion and unless yours hits and hits big then uh you're doing it for fun i mean of course the goal is to make uh money doing it uh, well, do I think I'll ever see my money back again by the time I've paid for equipment and lawyers and everything else? This is honestly, I've probably put about six, somewhere between six and eight thousand dollars in of my personal money. And that's not of uh, other people like bringing their equipment or their time and things like that. I mean, that's just straight. That's how much it's cost. And it's the attorney and it's most of it. How do you know people listen to it? Uh, well, you know people listen to it because you can pull all your stats, right? And you can see where they are and what they're doing. And I'm a stat junkie, so that makes me so happy. Yeah, I mean, we really just started on all our own social medias and just posting it out to friends and being like, hey, listen, hey, listen. Um, and then we've gone on Reddit and did a bunch of Reddit posts and things like that. And our writer is really big uh, into the Reddit community now. And so he uh, was posting as one of the characters for quite a while, like to generate interest we also decided that um, we would look at other people's podcasts to be like, hey, if you like blank, check out this. And we were like, well, we'll put an ad on ours for you if you put an ad on yours for us. Uh, I guess in some of the money that I've spent, we made t-shirts for everybody just because like that's a fun way to like have people be like, what are you asking for? Oh, and then we had a graphic designer. We had to pay out money for a graphic designer because we wanted uh, sketches of all the characters for the website and we wanted a website. There's some more money that you're going to have to pay for. And then to create your um, one inch by one inch piece that we had to pay somebody to make that because I'm not a graphic designer. So the ones that I made looked subpar in comparison. I did a deep dive into um, just looking at designers who design only for podcasts and colors and symbol and what it looks like and what audience you want to try to generate from it. There's, oh my gosh, there's way more in it. Like me, I was like, I'll go on Canva. I'll make like a little thing, you know? No, like not at all. Um, so we actually found someone who, um, who was well-versed in doing that. And it is really important because you want your piece to stand out. So when people are scrolling, I mean, you have to think about you. I mean, you meaning everyone. We just sit there and like, shh, 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 like, until something catches your eye and then you're like, oh, yeah. Or that's the very first thing anyone is going to see about you. Right? Like, that's it. That's what they see. They see this one little bitty one inch by one inch square about who you are. And all this work you've done comes into that square. Um, and whether or not you could make someone push that button and be like, 
I'm curious and then hit the button. So yeah, so I'm just, I mean, maybe I'm getting a little bit too passionate about that square, but it, it really makes, it, it weirdly makes a big difference on things that you're doing. Um, the other thing is your name too. I didn't even talk about that. But like the name that you choose, you've got to go out there and like look and see who has your idea for your name. Because we originally wanted to call our um, our audio drama The Gloom. But the word gloom pulls up so many things that like it wasn't even worth it because you're not going to get found. Right. Then we thought, oh, we'll call ourselves the Hecatonaries, which in Greek means the hundred handed. But um, no one can spell that or figure that out or know how to do that. So that's that was off the list and so that's that's important as well is to like check what other podcasts or bands a lot of times bands will pull up especially if you're searching spotify which is where most your people most our people come from spotify or apple and so it's searching music at the same time uh and so yeah you gotta you gotta be careful on that too so uh the best i think the best way we've gotten people is cross promotion that um, as soon as we started doing cross promotion, our numbers just like super spiked, and I was like, "Oh, okay." In fact, we had someone reach out to us last a uh, couple days ago. I guess that was last week, and um, and was like, "Hey, we want to do this, and don't just say yes to everybody because everybody's not as good as your podcast. So you got to listen to their podcast first and make sure that they're not saying crazy stuff, or if they're saying crazy stuff, that it aligns with the crazy stuff you say too." That's actually really important. Not all uh, not all publicity is good publicity in this case. And then we did guerrilla marketing too, where we had a bunch of stickers made up. And then every poll in Austin, I stuck a sticker on or I tried. Like every time I walked around, I keep them with me and I just wh whack them in bathrooms. I whack them on anywhere I can. I just stick a sticker up that uh, so people see you. Like the more they see the same emblem, it's the same um, as our square. So it's our square is the sticker and it just it doesn't even say podcast it doesn't say anything it's just a square of our logo and that's it and we stick it on there with our name on it nothing like exciting but they're yeah i wouldn't say they're everywhere but if anyone wants to start sticking our stickers around we'll happily let you earlier you mentioned metrics and i think this connects nicely with our conversation about promotional strategy for podcasting what metrics are you most interested in and why Oh my gosh. Okay. So my background is as a social statistician and I am such a data junkie. Um, I actually like Buzzsprout's uh, data that they send me way more than I like anchors only because they send it to me in a spreadsheet that I can like run statistical analysis on, which is only for my own personal satisfaction and not anything that anyone on our team cares at, at all about. Me, I was most concerned about looking at our target age and our basic genders that we hit. Um, and we hit predominantly, interestingly enough, uh, I thought we would hit higher male, but we hit pretty much uh, neck and neck. I think last I looked, we had like 49% male, 43% um, female, and like 8% non-binary. And I don't even know if that adds up right, but I think it does. Yeah, 40, 40, 48, 43, 49, 48, 100. I think that's close, or seven. But um, so those are the ones I like because from there, I also know the age range. So like I'm not targeting people who are 15 years old, right? I'm tar our target market. We're hitting people who are like between 30, 40, 50 years old is what we're hitting. And so I know then like if I'm in a release, most of these people who are between the ages of like 30 and 50, they're on their way to work. And that's when they're generally listening, right? So drop an episode at midnight, Right. So you're catching all the people who are still awake and then you're catching all the people with a new episode in the morning when they're headed to work and they're popping open their phones in their car and they're stuck in traffic and they're like, what am I going to do today? And then your episodes popped up on their thing. So so that's the way to do it. And there's like also other people's ideas about I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump into this now. But um, of like when to drop an episode, like, do you do it biweekly? Do you do it, you know, every week? Do you wait a month? And I say this. Drop it when you got it because people are going to listen and they're going to listen, uh, especially if you're first starting out. Once you have like a solid base of people that are listening to you, then you can be like, oh, I put out a weekly thing. But I feel like this whole weekly, oh, we're going to drop on Tuesdays at five o'clock in the afternoon. It's antiquated. It goes back to like television of my parents' generation that they were sitting around waiting for Tuesday at five o'clock. Nobody does that anymore. We don't care. Just give me what I need when I need it. You don't have to drop a whole season at the same time too, right? Like you don't have to have every single thing done because people are going to be notified when you put something new out. 
That being said, I would not put out like three things and then wait six months and then put out another two things or wait eight months. That's, I mean, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot if you're doing that. But, um, but you don't have to have all your content completed either when you first start dropping your episodes. Um, and you could also do like we do, we do minis. So we'll have like full episodes and then we'll have like a mini five minute kind of like spinoffs little thing that, um, one of them was that Solomon character playing chess with another character and Solomon gets angry and blows the board up, right? Like uh, something along those lines. So it's just like a little tidbit into the world uh, that you're giving so that you're giving people something, right? Um, and they're not just getting nothing. The things that apply to your audio drama that might also apply to a regular interview style podcast, what are those things? Oh, enthusiasm. Being prepared, I would say number one, be prepared. Like have your questions ready, be able to free, like be able to go off the cuff if you need to based upon what your person is saying, but have a list of questions ready like that that you know you can ask them. Give them to them ahead of time, right? Just like we give our actors the scripts ahead of time, give the people the questions ahead of time because no one wants to be caught off guard and like, um, well, maybe, uh, I don't know. That's a hard thing to do so like when we're interviewing our my other podcast works with poets and we enter okay so we interview a poet we create a poet profile about how they utilize poetry in their life to overcome trauma then we go in and we teach about that poet in the jails so to incarcerated individuals they write poems based on the poems that the poet has and then we bring the poems back to the poet and the podcast and we interview the poet about poetry in their life for the first half and then the second half we, we read the poems from the incarcerated individuals and they talk about those poems, right? So we give them, hey, here's what we're going to ask you. We're going to ask you about how poetry influenced your life. We're going to do the first half of the show like this. The second half, we're going to talk, you know, we're going to read the poems and we're going to provide you a copy of the poems ahead of time so that you can see them as we're reading them so that when we're talking about them, you've got something visual in front of you. So that's, um, I would say that's a really important part is kind of allowing someone to understand the process that you're going to go through before you do it and having as many of those pieces that they need as possible. Meaning like if we were just to ask the poet to listen to a poem and then off the cuff talk about it, they don't have a way to re to reference what we're talking about, right? So they need to have all the reference materials that they need up front to be able to feel comfortable, to participate, to like engage in a meaningful level that someone else would want to listen to, right? So you have to think about it. What really goes kind of the same and same is that you have to think about what does someone else want to listen to? Not what do you want to make? I mean, it's great, whatever you want to make, but you have to really think about the end, you like the end user is your audience and what do they care about to listen about? I mean, as far as equipment goes, we have a microphone that we ship to everybody. So we just send them a label and we're like, Sh we ship the microphone out to them and then they ship it back to us and we ship it out and ship it back. That's several hundred dollars a year just in shipping a microphone. Uh, so you got to think about that. Uh, because if they're not recording with something decent, you're getting like great recording from your side. But like they sound like n not so good. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't want to have that, that discrepancy in audio. So I would say your equipment is also important there. The other thing I think is really important, I didn't really touch on this with the audio drama, but we too big, like I always throw a big party for everybody. And I throw a party when we hit a certain number of numbers, like when we hit, um, we hit a thousand. The first time we hit a thousand, I was like, we got a thousand people who listen to us, right? Like a thousand unique downloads. This is amazing, guys. I'm so excited. Let's throw a party. Um, end of season one, we're all done recording. I throw a party. Right. Like, uh, so just to kind of keep that camaraderie going and to make sure it's like a big thank you to everybody for like all the work that they do. I also put out things to them that's like, hey, we hit 50,000 downloads or, you know, we got uh, we have over 100 five star reviews on Spotify now. Like I keep them up to date. And I think that's important to do, especially with your interview people um, in a traditional podcast. We always send out thank yous. Hey, thank you so much to, for listening. Um, we super appreciate you being part of this. Please, you know, whatever your topic is about, like you made an impact on XYZ's life. So-and-so said this, you know, we might then talk to the, the incarcerated individuals we've worked with and say, do you have anything you want to say to them about this? And then we'll incorporate that in an email. We'll also do follow-up emails um, six months later, generally, to be like, hey, just want to say thanks again for your work so that they, A, remember your podcast and B, um, they'll like, it's great, you know, 
And if you're not getting a lot of, you know, like we only got like 10 people to listen to it. Okay, which it hasn't happened. But let's just say hypothetically that happens. I wouldn't be like, we got 10 people. You know, I would be like, really appreciate the impact you're making on our episode list. We were great. We were happy to have you there. Things like that. For the 100 Handed, which is the audio drama, um, the promotion is pretty much underground or guerrilla, but we do we do uh, very little as far as like pushing it and we push it predominantly on social media with the reddit post and um the cross promotion with the personhood project which is the interview style one we we're okay we're actually really lucky that one runs through a nonprofit that i have and so we write grants for that one um it, most of our funding comes from Texas Commission on the Arts and the Humanities Texas, and they're amazing. They've supported us for several years doing this, and we write in promotion there. Um, so we'll do like big email blasts. We'll go through literary magazines and things like that in the poetry world to get that out there. While the Hundred Handed audio drama, we do more creative styles like more interactive type things whereas with the personhood project we'll do larger like blasts out into areas that will hit our target market which are poets excellent and are there other things that you've learned in the audio drama that translate beautifully to the personhood project because getting grants is very different from promoting a for-profit drama isn't it Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. You know, I I don't know. I'm not the most. I think that production is something that our promotion is something that I need to learn more about to do. And I'm not really. I think that I'm at the point now where I'm like, oh, wait, this isn't just a hobby that I have anymore. This is like something I'm actually doing. And I need to learn a little bit more about promotion. But what I've learned in both the translates to both of them is it's about creating connections with other people. And I think that is the main component. You can't just randomly expect someone over here to click on your podcast, even though your swear might be so amazing. They're not going to click there generally unless someone's told them about it. The other thing I've noticed is that once you start ranking up high enough, it'll say things like, if you loved blah, blah, blah show, check out da, 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 da. And so now that we've gotten enough to get on that, we're on that bottom area now. Like, did you love, um, I can't even think of one. I'm like, my brain is like glitching right now. But then we'll pop up on the bottom and it'll say, we'll try out this. And I think that a lot of people trust. I mean, I do. I trust that. I'm like, oh, okay. Like some computer algorithm figured out what I listened to. And now they're giving me ideas. Okay, I'll look at it, you know, and click it that way. And it and it works. So it's... um. It's about trying to figure out how to get there. One of the things we're thinking about for promotion is like our writer has written in a bar in San Marcos for some of the stuff to be occurring. So I was going to be brave and go to whatever bar we chose and be like, hey, we're going to put your bar in because it's awesome. You want to give us a donation <laughs> and like promote us at your place so that um, that can be kind of a fun way to do it uh, that way. So it made me think of like how they put soda cans in movies, right? Like they put Coke pays a whole bunch of money for all the actors to drink Pepsi. Pepsi pays a whole bunch of money for the actors to drink Sprite, whatever. But yeah, so maybe thinking about something like that. I'm going to see how that plays out. We're kind of curious if that'll even bring any traction or not or what we can get from that. So that's promotion. What about the other parts of podcasting? Because I know that the production oh, yeah. techniques and the c picking out the right kind of mic and are you using maybe a roadcaster? Nope. All, all the same. 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 Yep. We use all the same stuff. Yeah. All the same software. We use all the same uh, hosts. We use everything we do is the same. It's really just the content that's that's different. Yeah. Actually, we use all the same stuff. That's great. Sorry. That's a pretty boring answer. but No, yeah. it's great though because, because you're, <laughs> oh, like... when you think about it, you're using your for-profit business or your nonprofit, right? So well, that's a really good thing, right? Yes. I mean, yes. Yeah. It works out. Because you're helping. So, yeah. Because we're, yeah. So we're like, we only have one mic that we use through the nonprofit. We have four that we use for our for profit. So, yes, we can count one into our other stuff. So it's a different, you have to keep everything separate, obviously. But the kind of mics are the same, right? Correct. Correct. We don't have to buy a different style of mic for one versus another. We just buy, honestly, yeah, we just bought all the same kind of mics for everybody. 
Okay, here we go. This is it. What are you? You're an Apogee. There we go. You got an Apogee mic for everybody. So that's five Apogee mics. What we found in the scenes for the audio drama that we do is that we need four mics. So we just make sure that they're... It's hard. So that that is the other thing. Like, it is hard. You have to have more equipment for an audio drama than you do for something else. You can't have your actors in an audio drama passing a mic back and forth or leaning over. It just, everybody needs their own space. Sometimes we'll have more than four people, or I guess in this case, five, uh, in a scene. And you do have to sometimes have people share a mic. And it's, it's not the end of the world, but it's also not the greatest thing ever. You're not just producer of one podcast. You're producing two different podcasts with very different audiences and aims. Are there any things that they share in production? Honestly, what's really great for me is that the personhood project, which is the poetry one, the more traditional one, I have a host and he's the one who interviews. And then I also have another engineer, a different engineer that we use to do all of the um, audio work to it, to splice it and put it all together, put the music in and do all that. So both of them do that. And I just do QC. I do quality control where I like listen to it and go, yep, 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 no, yep, yep, yep. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so for me in that regard, that's much easier. And because I produce it, I there's a lot of stipulations and grants. So I can't necessarily like pay myself for it, but I can pay a host to do it. I can pay a different engineer to do it and we can use funds. So it really depends on like how the funding is set up to like what can be done. So I do the facilitation where I'll go into the jails and I'll teach the classes, but that's also the part that I love. I kind of don't do the parts I don't like. That sounds terrible. Like find out which parts you really love and the same thing with the other one. And I think that's really important. Find out the parts that you really love. If you hate sound effects or you're not great at music or you don't want to splice together like the text or the audio part of people, then maybe that's not Maybe you need to find somebody else who does love to do that. And having a partner and having other people to help makes it so much easier. As long as you pick people you can rely on, <laughs> you're good to go. So yes, the host and the sound engineer do the other podcast and I QC it. Whereas the audio drama, The 100 Handed, I do um, I do all the actors, I do all the producing and things like that. But then uh, Tom, the writer, also does a lot of the engineering as well. So, and sometimes we work together on that, but he knows that uh, it's not my forte. So you are incredibly motivated in both the audio drama and the interview podcast. What is your why? What motivates you to do both of these kinds of very different kinds of podcasts? Okay, I'm going to flip it and I'm going to talk about the Personhood Project, um, which is the more traditional interview style podcast. Um, I am a, um, a huge proponent of working with incarcerated individuals. Uh, I've been doing storytelling uh, with them for about eight years, working in Travis County and Heath County jails with men, women, and juveniles. Uh, it was really important to me to help people feel like their voices were being heard. And so while we would do storytelling events, um, we would do what I call inside and outside events. Outside, I would have people read poetry um, at open mic nights or things like that that were going on, or we would host uh, an evening of poetry. But there were never the people reading them themselves. Or we would do storytelling, but it would be what I would call an inside performance where we would be inside the jail and only people from the jail can come. We can't have an outside public audience. So the idea of creating this podcast was a way for me to help people feel valued in the community. Um, in that way, not only do they get to share their poetry, but they get to share it with the poet it's inspired from. They get to be able to say to any of their friends and family at any time they want, not just on March 3rd at Saturday at 10 o'clock, you know, we're going to have a reading. Tell your friends and family to come. In this case, they can be like, hey, that's there. It's there forever. And they can pull it up two years from now, two months from now, whenever they want, they can pull it up and be like, hey, man, look, check this out. I had a poet read my poetry, right? I and mean, this is what they said. And it's out there. And I did this. And this is something that, that they can feel value from. And to me, that is really important. However, I'm not a poet. So I had to find other people to help me make sure that this is possible. I'm more of a visual artist. So I do all of the actual visual art and we'll do like pop-ups and things like that. But in this case, you can't, 
you can't podcast visual art. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to you talk about someone's piece of art. Or if they do, I, I haven't found a big audience for that yet. And so that's that's my why. That's why I do the personhood project. Um, I found amazing people to help with it. It touches on everything that's important to me and why I developed the nonprofit that I did. The Hundred Handed, the audio drama, that's for my creative side. That's for my desire to be an actress, maybe a producer, to be in the middle of like feeling this creative energy with people, like being part of this fun, dark fantasy world that you get to be in. Yeah, it's really, to me, that's really exciting. It's a different level of creativity. It gets your juices flowing in a much different way. For me, the poetry is more an intellectual pursuit and social justice pursuit, whereas the hundred handed is more just like it's all fun. And so when it's really fun, none of it feels like work. When you're doing both of them, don't feel like work. They feel like I am extremely blessed to be able to get to do the things that I love to do and work with creative, awesome people and just like have these wonderful sessions where you get to see a whole different side of people that you may not have ever known. And I, uh, yeah, so each of them kind of satiates a different part of my soul, if that makes sense. What advice would you give to students who want to start one kind or the other? Where would they start and how would they get into it to have these kinds of passions nourish the way that you do? I would say pick what you love. Pick what you love. And spend some time really thinking about what part of it you enjoy. Because if you enjoy um, different parts of it, you need to find someone else to complement those parts. So like our musician that we have, I actually oddly found him on a Reddit post out there for people who are interested in podcast music. Weirdly, he happened to be from Austin and just happened to live like right not too far from me. So it was just like this weird thing. And I feel like when you're doing the things that you love to do, those types of things just fall into place. Like if you're forcing it and you're like having to like grind like over and over at this thing, then it, maybe it's not the right way to go. Because when you're doing this, it should be fun. It should be enjoyable. You should be liking what you do. It should be fulfilling part of you. Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Does it take time? Yes. Does it like require effort and energy? Yes. All of those. But if you're doing something you love, it's not going to feel so bad. His first starting out, yeah, just know that like you're creating something and create what you want. Don't create something for someone else. Create something for you because you're the one that's going to be putting this out there. And here's the other thing. And this is what's really important. And I taught at a culinary school and I would always tell my students, never serve someone something you wouldn't eat, right? Same thing. Like, don't put a product out you're not proud of. Like, if you're not proud of it, redo it. Take more time on it. Make sure that it's 100% that now you can walk into any room, hold your head high and be like, yeah, I made that. Yep, I did that and feel really good about the product that you're putting out. So I think that's even if you have to wait a little while, put out a product you're extremely proud of instead of just putting out anything. So extra time in post-production is what that sounds like, right? Extra time in everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because if it's not, again, like if you don't feel good about it, don't put it out there. Because if you don't feel good about it, and you're making it. Somebody else doesn't want to listen and they're not going to tell someone else to listen to it. Great advice for people who want to start podcasts. Brooke, where can people find both of these podcasts online? The Personhood Project you can find simply by typing in The Personhood Project into any podcast thing that you listen to, uh, platform that you listen to. You can also go on our website, um, roughdrafttx.org. And you can find it through the website as well, which gives a little bit more information and gives the poems and things like that. The other one, the audio drama, can be found online on our website at 100handed.com. Or you can type 100handed into anything, Spotify, Apple, whatever, wherever you like to uh, get your podcasts from. So subscribe now, follow now, whatever your platform <laughs> is. Do now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to ask for reviews, don't you? That's important. So yes, yeah. please go listen to an episode and review this podcast, The Hundred Handed. And Rough Draft, can you can you spell out the Rough Draft website for us? Sure. It's R-O-U-G-H-D-R-A-F-T-T-X dot org. Brooke, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom about this labor of love that you have engaged with so effectively. 
for your podcasts. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I really enjoy it. And I, you know, the more podcasts we can make out there in the world and the better they are, the greater chance we have of all being successful, right?